uh, everyone agrees, regardless of what their opinion is on this passage, that it must have been an intentional error. The text was changed to Manasseh because they want to protect, protect Moses. They don't want to dishonor Moses. It must have been changed in all kinds of places. How can we actually trust that this is what was transmitted from, you know, an earlier time period? The reality is that this is very rare. Hey everyone, this is What Your Pastor Didn't Tell You. Today I'm on with Dr. Mark Francois. We're going to be talking about how scribes changed the Bible and how it's not actually that big a deal. Dr. Francois, can you give us a little bit about your background and just, you know, tell, your, tell us how you're doing today? Okay, so uh, maybe I'll just uh, briefly start uh, off by talking about my, uh, my faith. And so, uh, like a lot of people, I grew up in a Christian home. And uh, at some point when I was fairly young, I made a decision to follow Jesus. I uh, don't know the exact date uh, or the exact time, but uh, what I often say to people is that uh, the exact date and time doesn't actually matter. Uh, what really matters is are you repenting of your sin, uh, believing in Jesus, giving your life uh, over to him. And so even though I didn't have the vocabulary to understand all of what that meant, uh, that's something that I did when I was fairly young. Uh, long story short, I got more serious about my faith uh, in high school. And I got very interested in studying scripture. I wanted to know a lot more than I did. I went off to Bible college, uh, went to Canadian Bible college for one semester. Uh, and then I spent about six years at Toronto Baptist Seminary. And uh, they really focused on biblical languages, which is something that I appreciated. Uh, then I did a two-year master degree at Wycliffe College at the University of Toronto. Uh, my master's thesis was actually on uh, textual criticism of the Old Testament, uh, focusing on the book of Obadiah. And then after that, I did a PhD. Uh, it's at the University of Toronto, but uh, it's part of the University of Toronto. It's the University of St. Michael's College. And I graduated in 2017 with a PhD in Old Testament. And uh, that one focused on, uh, the dissertation focused on uh, the relationship between uh, the curses of Deuteronomy 28 and uh, similar curses in what's called the Loyalty Oath of Esar Haddon uh, or Esar Haddon Succession Treaty. And so that's basically a little bit of my background, uh, faith uh, education. Uh, right now, I'm the pastor of Calvary Gospel Church in Blind River, Ontario, Canada. Uh, every once in a while as well, I will teach a course. So I just finished teaching a course on Deuteronomy uh, back in June at uh, Tyndale Seminary. And uh, I'm currently uh, working on an introductory grammar for a classical Syriac. Awesome. So we can call you Dr. Pastor Marc Francois. Yeah. Let's see. Um, all right. Yeah. So and before we get into, like, you know, these different types of cases where, you know, we have um, weird parts of the text going on, um, <clears throat> can you give us just um, a general overview of, you know, like, like, what's your opinion? Like, how often do these changes occur in textual tradition? Okay, so I think before we get to that, I think uh, there are a couple of really important points that uh, we have to talk about. And uh, I think the first point that we really need to talk about is that whenever we pick up a Bible in our hands, uh, the format that we have can be just a little bit misleading. Uh, it's very easy to get the impression that we're just dealing with a single book. Uh, but the reality is that whenever we pick up a Bible, it's actually a collection of books uh, written uh, in Hebrew. Uh, there's a couple that are written with parts in Hebrew and then parts in Aramaic. Uh, and then in the New Testament, we have uh, books that are written in Greek. So we're not just dealing with uh, a single book, but an, an entire collection of books. Uh, and then the other really important point to note as well is that uh, we don't have any original copies of the individual books that we have in the Old Testament. And so my focus is on the Old Testament. Uh, and so what that means is that there are no original copies for the individual books that we have of the Old Testament. Uh, what we have are handwritten copies. And uh, so getting back to your question, uh, part of the answer depends on which book of the Old Testament we're talking about. So some books will have more change, some books will have less change. Uh, but based on the manuscripts that we currently have and the evidence that we currently have, uh, the kind of changes that we're going to be talking about were relatively rare. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the leading uh, Old Testament uh, textual critics or textual critics of the Hebrew Bible, uh, his name is Emmanuel Tov. Uh, one of the points that he really emphasizes is that uh, when we're talking about intentional changes, for example, 
Uh, there aren't really that many of them. And uh, part of the reason why we know that is because every book that talks about these kind of changes deal with the exact same example. So uh, it's generally fairly rare, less rare. Um, it's less common than what you would see in the New Testament, for example, uh, but generally fairly rare. Okay. And could you briefly sum up like, what kinds of changes there occur? I mean, you have, a, 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 you know, intentional, accidental, you know, I guess, theological, intentional changes. Um, and, uh, and I guess just to sum up, maybe you can correct me if I'm, like, my understanding, it's, you know, when we're looking at this, the basic idea is that, you know, we, we see, a te we ha we see like, you know, an ancient manuscript, and then, well, you multiples, and you have one at a certain year, and then maybe one before that, and it's like, well, the one afterwards has a different reading than the one before that, so it, you know, it, it seems like something's going on, and, you know, we can make, I guess, assumptions or implications off that. Um, is that, like, a good way to, like, is that typically how we see, like, these changes occur, or how does that work? Yeah, so I think, uh, I guess the idea that we need to start off with is the fact that um, there is something that we're trying to reach back to, right? There is some kind of text that uh, would have been a standard canonical text that kind of stands at the head of the stream of uh, textual transmission. So all of the manuscripts that we have uh, at some point go back to something earlier. Now, how far back we want to go, uh, there is some debate when it comes to that, but there's a difference between uh, maybe changes that were made uh, in the authorial process of, of, of composing the books and then changes that took place after the books reached their final form. So, uh, for example, the book of Deuteronomy uh, is made up of a number of different sections. And uh, the book of Deuteronomy itself says that at one point, uh, some of these sections existed separately from each other. So uh, the Ten Commandments, for example, existed separately as its own document. Uh, we have the second speech of Moses versus the Song of Moses. Uh, but at some point, it reached a final canonical authoritative form. Uh, and then, in theory, all of the manuscripts that we have go all of the way back to that original canonical form. And so when we're talking about changes, we're talking about uh, deviations from the wording of that uh, that that copy that uh, hopefully all of these manuscripts can ultimately be traced back to. And so in terms of changes, uh, there, there are two broad types of changes that we could talk about. Uh, the first one would be unintentional changes, so changes that were done by accident when scribes were copying things out. Uh, and then we have intentional changes. So let's start off with unintentional changes. Uh, so unintentional changes uh, happen because the manuscripts that we have are written out by hand. And if you've ever read anything that's written out by hand, uh, it's very easy sometimes to misunderstand some of the things that are written there. Uh, that actually happened to me a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we're trying to update uh, our directory at church. Uh, someone wrote down their phone number. I completely misunderstood what the first uh, three numbers in the phone number were uh, because they, written up, they wrote it out by hand. Uh, that happens quite a bit when someone gives me a handwritten note. Uh, sometimes I have to compare letters. <laughs> you know, this, this is how they write their O, or this is how they write their B, uh, and then I'm able to piece it together. And so uh, sometimes when you're copying out a text by hand, mistakes can end up creeping into the text uh, by accident. And so let's just uh, go through a couple of examples. Uh, in some cases, uh, a scribe might have been copying out a text, and they might have skipped over a word by accident. Uh, or in some cases, they might have even skipped over an entire line. And so we have examples of that. So their eye might have skipped from, let's say, uh, the text said Israel. And then a little bit later on, it says Israel. Their eye might skip from the first Israel to the second Israel. And then everything in between ends up getting deleted. And we know it's deleted because we'll have manuscripts that will have everything that's in between. Uh, there are some cases when a scribe would end up repeating a word twice or repeating uh, an entire line twice without realizing that that's what they were doing. Uh, sometimes the scribe would misunderstand a letter. And so I mentioned that with uh, phone numbers, with numbers in English and handwritten uh, numbers, we can sometimes misunderstand what people write down. Uh, very same thing happens with Hebrew. Uh, Hebrew, uh, the, the script that we use today is basically uh, an Aramaic script that was eventually adopted by, by Jewish people. Uh, but the original Hebrew script as well, uh, you know, in both of these scripts, sometimes letters can end up being confused with each other. Uh, we're all used to reading things in, in typewritten form, which makes it very easy to distinguish, distinguish letters. Uh, 
Uh, but again, in manuscript form, very often the letters can look uh, quite similar. Uh, sometimes uh, if you have manuscripts that are translated from Hebrew, uh, sometimes the translator might have misunderstood what the Hebrew said, and those translations are important witnesses to the text. And so, for example, if you're translating from Hebrew to Greek, uh, which did happen, uh, if the scribe also knew Aramaic, which is very close to Hebrew, uh, sometimes there might be linguistic interference where they, under, they end up taking the Aramaic meaning of a root in Hebrew and translating that into Greek rather than what it actually meant in Hebrew. So these are all accidental errors, uh, and in most cases, they're fairly easy to spot. Uh, now, the other kind of error that we have are intentional errors, and so these were ones that were introduced uh, by scribes on purpose. And so just a couple of examples, uh, not being exhaustive, but uh, one example is referred to as harmonization. And so that's an example where you might have two stories or one story in the Old Testament that's repeated in two different places uh, or one law that's repeated in two different places. And every once in a, every once in a while, a scribe might take details from one version of the story and insert it into the other version of the story, or one version of the law and insert it into the other version. Uh, that's something that happens quite a bit in the Samaritan Pentateuch, uh, which is the version of the first five books of the Old Testament that was uh, preserved by the Samaritan community. Uh, another example, uh, sometimes scribes would change the text to try to avoid dishonoring God or dishonoring a figure that they really revered. So uh, if something negative was said against Moses, then they might want to change the text. So it doesn't quite say that. Uh, or if something is in the text that might show some disrespect towards God, they might change that or soften up the language a little bit so that it doesn't seem quite as bad. Um, some cases, uh, they change the text on purpose to purposely insult pagan gods. And so one example that's really good is uh, we have the names like Jeroboam, right? Or, uh, yeah, Jeroboam is a really good example. Uh, that's, uh, you know, Baal is the name of that Canaanite god uh, whose title is Baal, which means Lord. And uh, very often in the Old Testament and in manuscripts of the Old Testament, they change Baal to Bosheth, right? So we have the name Ishbosheth, uh, and Bosheth means shame. Right? So instead of saying, you know, man of Baal, they'll say man of a shameful thing. And so that's just trying to purposely insult uh, pagan gods. Uh, and then in some cases, uh, scribes would change the text on purpose for theological reasons. And so they might have been worried that the text would be misunderstood or might go against uh, what is currently believed. And so they might have subtly modified the text to make it less theologically problematic. And so intentional errors, unintentional errors. Uh, but again, in the vast majority of cases, uh, they're fairly easy to spot uh, because of the manuscript evidence that we have. And a little bit off topic here, um, so, well, off script at least. Uh, you, so you mentioned like how, um, you know, they, they might want to take something out or change the text a little bit so they, you know, they're not going to insult their, you know, favorite figure like Moses or something like that. Um, so... In regards to, like, theological reasons, like, you know, polytheism and, like, oh, you know, there's only one God, so we know that, like, the scribe might be thinking, oh, we know that the, you know, this, this text must be wrong because we know there's not more than one God, so it can't be talking about one, more than one God, so it has to be something different. But we can't really say that about something like, you know, someone trying to protect the name of Moses. So, like, that seems almost like in our eyes is at least a moral that that someone would do that or I don't know do you do you have any thoughts on that like that seems like a little above and beyond as far as like you know protecting like and why like why would they even do that to begin with like yeah so I, I would say that when when we're talking about some of these uh, these changes that have been made a, a lot of these changes are things that would have happened fairly late in the transmission process and so the earlier scribes wouldn't have had a problem with all of these things. So uh, if there was a text that said something negative about Moses, uh, they'd be fine with that. Their, their initial or their, their main goal was to preserve the text that was handed down to them. Uh, it's really only a little bit later on 
And so, you know, around the time of Jesus, a little bit before, a little bit afterwards, uh, that some people felt the need to to update things or change things to kind of soften things. And so uh, their their motivation, I think, in, in one sense was good because they, they want to honor God and they want to honor Moses. On the other hand, if, if the goal is to preserve the text uh, in the way that it was handed down, then they're kind of betraying part of what uh, what they're trying to do. And so, uh, you know, from our perspective, we would say, uh, no, just preserve the text. It's not your job to to try to soften things for us. We can deal with those things theologically. Uh, just give us the text as it was handed down to you. And uh, so I would say, yeah, bad motivation, but uh, these things happen. They're human beings. And, uh, you know, sometimes these motivations that they have end up overruling maybe what they should be doing, which is preserving the text. But again, that's that's generally a relatively late phenomenon, late phenomenon rather than something that you see very, very early in the textual tradition. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So you think it has to kind of like almost, they're elevating the status of Moses, like, you know, he's not just a man, like, this is like, this is like one of the 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 greatest men alive and that what you know one of his sons is not going to have this issue or he's not going to look bad like that that kind of thing yeah and 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 same with uh i mean a, a good parallel example would be you know the name of god in the old testament right and so we don't actually know the correct pronunciation of the name of god in the old testament we just have the characters uh yo would uh yo hey uh hey wow hey uh so yahweh and uh, so, and, and part of the reason why we have that is because they felt, well, God's name is so sacred and we're not supposed to use his name, you know, with an empty purpose. And so let's just never pronounce God's name. And so the motivation for doing that was reverence and for, you know, kind of fencing around that commandment that says, don't take the Lord's name in vain. Uh, but what they're doing is they're going beyond what the Old Testament actually allows, because obviously back during uh, earlier time periods, they pronounced God's name. It was there in the text. They would have said Yahweh. And so in some ways, they're trying to be more reverent than the actual authors of Scripture. And I think uh, that's go- that's going too far, right? We need to be uh, just, I mean, they should have been preserving the text that was given to them. And uh, if these authors of the text thought that something was okay, like pronouncing God's name, uh, then obviously that's something that should be okay. If that is your authoritative text, then then obviously we should be able to pronounce God's name. Uh, and if it says something negative about Moses, then we have to say something negative about Moses. Uh, but that being said, it didn't get rid of everything that's negative about Moses. And so again, this is fairly rare. Moses is presented negatively in a couple of places. And uh, so this wasn't a universal thing, just something that would happen uh, rarely on occasion. Very well said. I appreciate that. Okay, so Let's go ahead and get into examples. So you have Deuteronomy 32.8, Sons of God. This would be fun. Can you talk about uh, just general survey of what manuscripts we have and what they read as well as, like, you know, the general dating of these texts? Yeah, for sure. So I, I think a good place to start would be to uh, give kind of a base English translation for what uh, people would normally see in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 8. So uh, start off with the King James Version. So the King James Version says this. Uh, When the Most High divided uh, to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. And so this is a passage that takes place uh, during the Song of Moses, which is uh, Deuteronomy chapter 32. Uh, It's meant to get the people of Israel ready to go into the promised land, but also to explain to them that their failure uh, is going to be inevitable. They're they're inevitably going to end up uh, disobeying the the Deuteronomic code, the the law section that we have in Deuteronomy chapter twelve uh, through twenty six. And uh, part of what is being done here is they're trying to show uh, God has done so much for you. Uh, God chose you uh, to be His special people, and that's one of the reasons why rebellion against Him is so serious. And so it's saying uh, in the King James, uh, at least, uh, that when God separated the peoples. Uh, he divided up all the peoples according to the number of the sons of Israel, the children of Israel, but Israel was God's possession, right? Israel was God's possession. Uh, the NIV says something very similar, basically the same thing. Uh, when the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, uh, when he divided all mankind, he set up boundaries for the peoples according to the number of the sons of Israel. Now, that's the reading that's found in the vast majority of, 
of the manuscripts that we have. So if we were to take a look at the uh, most complete Hebrew manuscripts that we have, uh, we call them the Masoretic uh, manuscripts. Uh, these come from the medieval period, and so well after the time of Jesus, but uh, they're the fullest Hebrew manuscripts that we have. They all say, according to the number of the sons of Israel. Uh, you take a look at the Samaritan Pentateuch, uh, which is a, you know, a, a very old translation, or not an old translation, a very old Hebrew witness to the text. Uh, it also says, according to the number of the sons of Israel. Uh, the Syriac Peshitta, which is probably first century AD uh, translation into Syriac, uh, it also says according to the number of the sons of Israel. So almost all of the manuscripts say according to the number of the sons of Israel. Uh, but when we take a look at manuscripts that we have of the Septuagint, uh, which is uh, a Greek translation of the first five books of the Old Testament uh, that dates to about the third century BCE in its original form, uh, the Septuagint says something different. It doesn't say according to the number of the sons of Israel or according to the number of the children of Israel, it says this. Uh, when the Most High divided up the nations, when he scattered the sons of Adam abroad, he established the territories of the nations according to the number of the angels of God. According to the number of the angels of God. So see the difference. It's See the difference. It's uh, He divided them up according to the number of the sons of Israel or according to the number of the angels of God. Now, all the way back in 1895, and even before that, uh, there were scholars who would say, well, this is what must have been behind the Septuagint's translation of this passage. So uh, there, there are some people who say, you know, the Septuagint's written in Greek. It shouldn't matter. It doesn't count as a manuscript uh, when we're trying to figure out what the original wording says. The only thing that matters uh, are manuscripts that are written in Hebrew. Uh, the problem with saying that is that the Septuagint must have been translated from something. It must have been translated from a Hebrew text. And so even though the Septuagint is written in Greek, it gives us access to a Hebrew text that predates the Septuagint. So an older Hebrew text. And so as long as, long as we're sure that the differences that we have uh, are not translation mistakes uh, and that they actually go back to the uh, original text that they were translating, uh, these are important textual witnesses to the text. And so it says, according to the number of the angels of God. And so back in 1895, if you take a look at Samuel uh, Driver's commentary on Deuteronomy, uh, he would already say at that point, well, you know, the, the Hebrew text that the Septuagint was based off of probably said, according to the number of the sons of God. And so he knows that. And the reason why he knows that uh, is because, number one, uh, it kind of sounds like that in, in Hebrew. So according to the number of the sons of El, so according to the number of the sons of God versus according to the number of the sons of Israel. And so it sounds very similar. Uh, the other way that they know that is that if you take a look at the book of Job, for example, it talks about the sons of God appearing before Yahweh, before God. And uh, in the Septuagint, when it translates sons of God, it translates it as angels. And so the idea there is that even in the Septuagint, they're trying to soften things up a little bit. They don't want to say sons of God. Uh, so let's try to make that a little bit more theologically appropriate and make it angels of God. Uh, fast forward to 1939. Uh, there was a Septuagint manuscript that was discovered in Egypt that dates to about the first century BCE or the second century BCE. So a very, very old copy of uh, this portion of the Septuagint. Uh, and instead of saying according to the number of the angels of God, it says according to the number of the sons of God. And so basically right now, the, uh, there's a critical edition of the Septuagint, which is the standard edition of the Septuagint. Uh, basically, even th what the agreement is right now is that even though there are really only a couple of Septuagint manuscripts that say according to the number of the sons of God. That's probably what the Septuagint originally said. And it was only later on that that was changed for theological reasons to according to the number of the angels of God. Fast forward just another decade, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls are discovered. And eventually, there's a fragment that's discovered that's uh, referred to as 4Q Deuteronomy J. And uh, this fragment is written in Hebrew probably dates to about 50 BC. Uh, it confirms the reading that we have in the Septuagint. 
And it generally confirms that reconstruction that Samuel Driver came up with in 1895, along with other scholars. And so this is what it says in 4Q Deuteronomy J. So a fragment of a Dead Sea Scroll manuscript. Uh, it says, he established the territories of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God, according to the number of the sons of Elohim. So maybe Driver wasn't quite right when he said according to the number of the sons of Ale, but uh, Ale and Elohim uh, would be somewhat equivalent terms. And there's debate about which one would be original. But that's the exact same reading that we have uh, in the Septuagint, the original Septuagint, and even what we can reconstruct based on what later manuscripts of the Septuagint say. And so that's the manuscript evidence that we have. Uh, the vast majority say, according to the number of the sons of Israel, but then we have, you know, Septuagint manuscript, early Septuagint manuscript, sons of God, and then we have uh, that one fragment from uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, according to the number of the sons of God. Very fascinating. <clears throat> okay, can you talk about possible, well, I, maybe you kind of did, uh, can you talk about possible explanations for how this occurred? Like, it, it was the, the, the translators just trying to make it so there aren't many gods? Is, is that simply all it is? Yeah, so, I mean, I mean, there's two possibilities, right? So whenever you're looking at um, a textual issue, uh, whenever you see a difference in the manuscripts or the witnesses that we have to the text, uh, we have to figure out which one is the right one, if, if any of them are the right one. And so the general principle is that you want to, you know, the one that is likely original, uh, the one that's likely earlier, uh, is the one that best explains the existence of the other readings. And so if you can figure out, well, how did this... Uh, this wording change from this one to that one, if you can figure out a mechanism that allows that to happen, uh, that's probably the right reading. Whereas if you try to go the other way, you know, it might not actually work. Now, in this case, it's, it's generally recognized that this would not have been an unintentional error. So this isn't a copy and mistake. Uh, this isn't something, you know, based on the lettering that we have that could have happened by accident. Uh, everyone agrees, regardless of what their opinion is on this passage, that it must have been an intentional error. And so, I mean, you can just boil it down. There's two possibilities. Uh, one possibility is that the text originally said, according to the number of the sons of Israel, and then some scribe changed it to, according to the number of the sons of God. And, uh, you know, most people would look at that and say, that doesn't really make much sense. Uh, why would you change a text that makes sense into something that's theologically problematic? And uh, to, to understand why it's theologically pro problematic, I think we have to understand how people back then would have understood that term sons of God. And so if you're looking at Hebrew, or if you're looking at Phoenician, which would be, you know, a Canaanite uh, dialect, uh, or any of the other languages in that area around that time period and earlier, uh, whenever you see that phrase sons of God, it simply means the gods, right? <laughs> so uh, w what category of being uh, do gods reproduce when they have kids? Well, the category of being that they reproduce is another god, kind of like, you know, Zeus would be one of the sons of the gods, or Baal would be one of the sons of the gods. And so if you're reading this, uh, you know, before the time of Jesus, or even around the time of Jesus, some people would look at that and say, well, is this passage saying that more than one god exists? That, uh, you know, but we believe that there's only one god, so it can't mean that. And so the Septuagint solution was, was, was fairly simple, and it was very, you know, it wasn't very intrusive. Let's change sons of God to angels of God, because that's something that we can understand. So angels are beings that are somewhere between, you know, God at the top of the scale and then human beings at the bottom. They're supernatural creatures. Maybe other cultures might call them gods, but, you know, they're not the one true most high God. But just so that we're absolutely clear on that, let's just call them angels. Uh, so that's very, you know, it's a very small change that's made to it that uh, helps to clear up that problem. Uh, but uh, the most likely explanation for, you know, the Hebrew text that we have uh, in all of the, pretty much all of the manuscripts that we have, according to the number of the sons of Israel, they were so uncomfortable with this idea that they must have changed the text. And so we don't want to give any hint whatsoever that there could possibly be more than one deity. So let's change the text. And uh, this isn't just something that happens in De Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 8. That happens a little bit later on in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 43, I believe. And so let's, let's get rid of that because we, we can't give any hint whatsoever. 
uh, that any other gods might exist besides the God of Israel. And so the vast majority of scholars that specialize in this area and uh, that work in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, they think that this is the, the best explanation. Uh, there's a theological problem, and uh, the text must have originally said according to the number of the sons of God, uh, but to resolve that theological problem, to make sure there's no misunderstanding, they decided to change the text to make it theologically easier. And that seems to be the best explanation. The other way simply doesn't make any sense. Why would you introduce uh, a problem into the text that wasn't there in the first place? Yeah, so kind of on those lines, um, I mean, just speculation, just throwing this out there. I mean, why, why couldn't it have been some, why couldn't it have been someone that, you know, either didn't like Christians or, uh, well, let's see, move it. Yeah, so, so why, why wouldn't it be that, you know, someone just like doesn't like Christians or maybe that is polytheistic that also believes in Yahweh. Maybe that's the translator or yeah, the scribe or whatever. Why, like why wouldn't it, couldn't it be that they like, you know, it, it was originally sons of Israel and then this like this rebel type of person comes along and is like, hey, we should change it to this. Yeah. Well, what, can, what can it be that? Yeah, so, um, yeah, that would be the idea of a, of, of a heretic uh, being the person that introduced <laughs> this error. So, uh, I mean, a good analogy would be New Testament textual criticism, which, uh, w- which works quite a bit differently from Old Testament textual criticism. Uh, but one of the criteria that's uh, criterion uh, criteria that are used in that's used in New Testament criticism, textual criticism uh, is the idea of geographic distribution. And so if you have one heretic that introduces uh, something into a text, well, maybe that reading that we have into the text might only be found in manuscripts in Egypt. Uh, it's not going to be found in the West somewhere in Spain because uh, if it's only one person introducing it, it's likely going to be something that's local, that's not going to catch on uh, everywhere else. Now, when it comes to Old Testament textual criticism, it's a little bit more difficult to do uh, something like that. But I would say it would be difficult to imagine uh, that uh, that uh, a, a heretic would it be able to introduce something like this, and then it ends up being in whatever parent text was used to translate the Septuagint, and it wouldn't just be one manuscript. They would have probably been familiar with other ones. They, uh, they wouldn't have just said, hey, well, there's one manuscript that says sons of God, so let's go with that. When we all know it should say sons of Israel, uh, it must have been an established thing by the time that was uh, already uh, translate, translated. Uh, and then you take a look at that one manuscript uh, or fragment of a manuscript that we have from Qumran as well. Uh, it shows up there too. So uh, if it's a heretic doing it, uh, it's very, very unlikely that would it would have caught on in that way. Um, and so, again, we're dealing with probabilities. Uh, but I'd say the other reason why we know that's the case is that um, uh, it actually makes much better sense in context. And so this would be an example of internal evidence. You have external evidence, which would be uh, the manuscripts. But we also have internal evidence. Uh, what does what what is the passage actually trying to say? Does the passage make sense if it's if it means according to the number of the sons of Israel? Uh, it doesn't make sense <laughs> if we say according to the number of the sons of Israel, because when God divided up the nations, the sons of Israel didn't exist, <laughs> right? So this is talking about a, a time period as much earlier than when Abraham would have been around or any of the Israelites would be around. Uh, how on earth would God divide up the nations according to the number of the sons of Israel? Uh, Theologically, within that context, it also makes sense. It's basically saying God divided up the nations according to these heavenly beings. We would call them angels today, back then, call them sons of God. But, you know, they're not they're not the one God, but they're they're very powerful beings. God gave the nations to each these individual, uh, you know, divine beings, supernatural beings. But Israel was the one that God himself took for himself. The Most High took Israel for himself. And so they have other, you know, divine beings that uh, take care of them. I take care of Israel. And that's why when you rebel against me, it's a big deal. You get the Most High God. They just get, you know, these divine beings that are lower than me. Uh, I have a special relationship with you. And so in context, it makes a lot of sense. It makes a huge amount of sense. And so I'd say based both on the external, you know, unlikelihood uh, and then also how it makes sense internally as well. I think it's, yeah, it's, it's very, very clear. Uh, it's not a heretic introducing this. This is more of a, you know, a theologically orthodox person who's trying to remove a problem. Yeah, and that kind of gets into my, one of my later questions for you, which was, you know, 
is this just speculation? In a lot of ways, it doesn't seem like it is because you have a long line of reasons to think that you know it's one specific one, and then the other interpretation just doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So I mean, uh, I mean, talking about uh, the the issue of speculation, I think. Uh, you know, it's, de- it's definitely not just speculation. And so it has to do with building a case. And I think uh, one of the best ways to understand, you know, the, the amount of certainty that we have on this is to kind of uh, compare it to the way that things are done in, uh, in, a, in a court of law. And so if we're dealing with, you know, a criminal case, uh, we're never dealing with 100% certainty, right, that this person absolutely did this. I mean, in some cases, it would be 100% certainty, but that's not what's required to convict someone. Uh, what's uh, required is, you know, evidence beyond a reasonable doubt. And so never 100% certainty uh, is required, uh, but only beyond a reasonable doubt. You go to civil cases, uh, the standard of evidence is lower. So the preponderance of the evidence, uh, it's more likely than not that this is the case based on all of the evidence that we have. And uh, so when we're taking a look at some of these text critical issues, you know, in some cases, you know, it's beyond a reasonable doubt that this is the case. Uh, in some cases, especially when we're dealing with copying errors, right? So if, if they repeat a word twice or a line twice, you know, beyond reasonable doubt, almost 100%. Uh, in other cases, it has to do with being being more likely than not. And so that's the kind of the category that I would put Deuteronomy 32 verse 8 in. It's not beyond all reasonable doubt. I mean, we could all think of scenarios uh, uh, where, you know, you came up with a scenario uh, where someone might change the text the other way around. Uh, but, you know, the preponderance of the evidence suggests that the original reading was, according to the number of the sons of God, it is more likely than not that that is the case. And, uh, you know, and then there are some cases where we just have to admit we're not sure, right? Sometimes the evidence could go both ways. And I think uh, whenever you're dealing with something on an academic level, uh, you have to be able to be honest and just say, you know, this is the evidence that we have. You know, I'm 50-50 on it, or maybe I'm 60-40. I don't know which way it's going to go, or we might not have an explanation for why this is the case, uh, but this is the evidence. And so I, I'd say, you know, regardless of which, excuse me, which textual issue we're talking about, we have to be honest about the amount of certainty, sometimes a lot, sometimes you know, a fair amount of certainty, and then sometimes we, we're just not entirely sure. Yes, thank you. Well said. <clears throat> okay, so... As far as uh, when the change occurred, you hinted at it. Could you talk about like, when do we think the change occurred? Yeah, so one of, one of the problems with talking about when changes occur is that uh, we, we have a very incomplete uh, manuscript tradition. And so w- when we're talking about New Testament textual criticism, for example, uh, there are so many manuscripts. It's, it's unbelievable how many manuscripts there are. And uh, manuscripts that are very early. Uh, and not just manuscripts, but translations, early translations in the New Testament. Uh, it's ridiculous how much information there is for New Testament textual criticism. And uh, you can do a fairly good job of reconstructing things. So there's going to be some gaps, but uh, there's so much evidence, it's, it's unbelievable. Uh, when it comes to Old Testament textual criticism, uh, there's not nearly as much evidence. And the evidence is not nearly as old from a relative perspective. So if you're trying to talk about uh, you know, the distance from when a book was written to when we have manuscript evidence, the distance is a lot bigger uh, when we're dealing with Old Testament textual criticism. And so if we're talking about Deuteronomy uh, 32, verse 8, uh, we don't necessarily have all of the evidence uh, available to us, uh, but we, we can kind of give a general idea. So we know that at least you know, in the 3rd century BCE, uh, there were manuscripts around that said according to the number of the sons of God. You know, around 50 BCE, there were manuscripts that said according to the number of the sons of God. Uh, we know that by probably the first century, second century AD, that uh, there were manuscripts that said according to the number of the sons of Israel, because that's what the Peshitta version of the Old Testament has. Uh, and then also there were revisions that were made to the Septuagint that tried to make it align with the Masoretic tradition. Uh, second century AD, and they would have, according to the number of the sons of Israel. So uh, we don't know for sure, but if I had to guess, I'd say anywhere between 300 and 100 BCE, uh, the change was made. And uh, what probably happened is that these these manuscripts would have coexisted at the same time. And so you go to one area, some manuscripts might have said, according to the number of the sons of God, and then another place down the road, according to the number of the sons of Israel, and then it just happens to be that uh, the text that became authoritative uh, in Judaism, according to the number of the sons of 
Israel, uh, that became authoritative. And so that ended up spreading to some of these daughter translations. And uh, as a result, that's the, what the majority of our Hebrew manuscripts have. Virtually all of the Hebrew manuscripts that we have uh, say that uh, just because they're all based on what was the authoritative text, you know, from about 200 AD onwards, or maybe even a little bit before that as well. Hmm. So that's just again, so 300 to 100 BC. Yeah, totally. So uh, um, <clears throat> isn't it possible that the earliest texts that we have found got it wrong and the earliest manuscripts that support the Sons of Israel interpretation simply haven't been found yet? Yeah, so there's, there's always the possibility that some manuscript uh, could be discovered that's older, and that would be absolutely amazing because we need to have more <laughs> manuscripts uh, that uh, tell us uh, things about the history of the text. Uh, when it comes to this particular issue, though, it wouldn't make any difference. Uh, and the, the reason for that is that when we're dealing with readings, um, when the wording of a text is, is disputed, uh, the key factor is not the age of the manuscript. And so I think very often just on a popular level, people think older equals better, right? So if it says it in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it has to be better. Uh, that's not necessarily the case, right? Uh, the medieval Hebrew manuscripts that we have, so for example, uh, our, our critical editions of the Old Testament, uh, the main body of the text comes from a manuscript that was written in 1008 A.D., which is very late. That's that's a thousand years ago. So it's not really that old uh, when you take a look at you know the, the entire history of uh, biblical transmission. Uh, but the Hebrew text that we have in that in that manuscript that's only about a thousand years old, we know based on comparisons with other manuscripts that that text is actually older than some of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Right. So uh, if you take a look at uh, for example, one manuscript of Isaiah that we have from the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, it gives updated spellings, right? Spellings that would make the text easier to read. Uh, you take a look at these medieval manuscripts that we have, it, they don't have the updated spellings. And so even though they're only about a thousand years old, uh, they were faithfully copied over the centuries and reflect, you know, passages that or reflect readings that would have been way older than the actual manuscript. Uh, Obadiah, for example, uh, the the reading that we have in that manuscript from 1008 AD is basically identical to uh, one of the manuscripts that was found almost a thousand years earlier from the Judean desert, almost 100% identical. And so age doesn't really matter. Uh, like I said, the, the issue has to do with which reading best explains the existence of the other readings. So it's definitely possible. Maybe, maybe a manuscript is discovered in 300 BC that says, according to the number of the sons of Israel, uh, we still have to explain how did the other reading arise? Which one is more likely? Uh, did they change it from something that is not problematic to something that's problematic, or did it go the other way around? So uh, I hope that more manuscripts are discovered, but when it comes to this issue, it doesn't really make any difference. Um, I, would, I would assume for the sake of argument uh, that the reading sons uh, of Israel is just as old as those manuscripts that we spoke about. Very fascinating, okay. So you have the sons of God phrase but in Deut Deuteronomy 32.8, but you do not have it in other parts of the text. So why would the scribe change it in one part but not in the others? Yeah, so I would say, I'd say that there's maybe a couple of possibilities. Uh, I'd say <clears throat> that one possibility uh, is that the scribe who is responsible for making this particular change to the text uh, might have only been responsible for copying out either the book of Deuteronomy uh, or maybe just the first five books of the Old Testament. And so, uh, you know, when we read an Old Testament, uh, it's all under one cover. And that, that's not the way that they would have had uh, the books of the Old Testament in the past. Uh, they would have been written on scrolls originally. And so, you know, scrolls have a limited amount of space on them. And so when we're talking about a scribe copying out a book, uh, they're not necessarily copying out all of the Old Testament. And so it's possible, I mean, my guess would be that this person would have copied out the first five books of the Old Testament, and that would have probably been it. It's also possible maybe his job was to copy out the book of Deuteronomy, less likely. Uh, but, uh, you know, maybe he couldn't get his hands on the other ones, or he wasn't just responsible for uh, translating, for example, Job chapter 1, which also talks about the sons of God, or uh, Psalm 29. And so maybe that one scribe just wasn't responsible for copying out those other texts. Um, another possibility, and I think this one, you know, would have to be seriously considered, uh, it has to do with where this text is found, right? So this text is found in the Pentateuch, in the Torah. 
And so for Jewish people, the Torah has a level of authority that is above the other books of the Old Testament. And so it's possible that they said, well, you know what, it's fine if Job talks about the sons of God. Let, let Job do whatever Job wants to do. Let Psalm 29 do whatever Psalm 29 wants to do. But in the books of Moses, we can't have this. And so there are a couple of other places where we do see this in the Pentateuch. Uh, Genesis chapter 6 talks about the sons of God seeing the daughters of men and uh, uh, having children with them. Uh, I, I imagine that wasn't changed because there's other ways of explaining the text. It doesn't have to mean these divine beings coming down. So there's other ways of explaining the passage. Um, when it comes to the uh, another one, so later on in Deuteronomy chapter 32, that was changed, right? And so either one of these possibilities are, you know, a possibility. Either he was only responsible for copying out the first five books, uh, or the books of Moses have such a high level of authority, uh, we don't want to have any, con uh, any confusion in, the, in those ones. Other passages it, later on in the Old Testament, fine, but not in the books of Moses. Awesome. Thank you for that. Okay, so, uh, I mean, I've got all day, but feel free to, you know, take as long as you want with this one. Uh, yeah, is there any, any other interesting um, scenarios in history where we have a text that appears to be changed, and can you talk about a couple of those? Okay, so uh, like I mentioned uh, way earlier on, uh, Emmanuel Tov mentions the fact that, uh, you know, very often when people talk about these problems, uh, they end up talking about the same problems over and over again. And, and part of the reason is because uh, there aren't really a lot of changes that have been made. And so uh, sometimes people get the idea, you know, scribes change the text. And so it must have been changed in all kinds of places. How can we actually trust that this is what was transmitted from, you know, an earlier time period? Uh, the reality is that this is very rare. So I'm only going to give two examples, and they're definitely less dramatic than the ones uh, than the one that we talked about with Deuteronomy 32, uh, verse 8. Uh, but the first one is one of my favorite ones. This is Judges chapter 18 and verse 30. Uh, and this is the one that talks about uh, uh, a priest that was a priest for the tribe of Dan and for the idol that the tribe of Dan worshipped. And in Judges chapter 18, verse 30, there, there's some... Uh, debate in the manuscript, uh, whose grandson is this person? Is this Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Manasseh, according to some manuscripts? Uh, or is it Jonathan, son of Gershom, uh, the son of Moses? And so what's interesting is that in this case, the manuscript evidence is, is much more evenly divided. And so we do have, uh, you know, Septuagint manuscripts that would say one or the other. Uh, and uh, we have Hebrew texts that would say one or the other. And what's interesting is that in, in the standard Hebrew texts that we have, so the one that I mentioned that, that was uh, copied in 1008 uh, AD, uh, that serves as the base uh, text for our critical editions, that one is really interesting uh, because it has Manasseh, which in Hebrew is Manasseh, Manasseh. It has that written out, but it has the letter Nun, so the letter N, written halfway above the line, right? So you have uh, the letters written, Mena you know, Manasseh, the beginning part, but the N is halfway above the line. And uh, the reason why it's written above the line, and this, is, this isn't just me saying this, this is the Jewish tradition saying this, is that the text actually said this, the, the grandson of Moses, right? And the text was changed to Manasseh because they want to protect, protect Moses. They don't want to dishonor Moses in any way. Now, in, in English, Manasseh and Moses look quite a bit different. In Hebrew, the only difference is that letter N, the letter Nun. That is the only difference. If you add that letter Nun, it becomes Manasseh instead of Moshe. And so uh, that's a really good example. And basically everyone agrees, even the Jewish tradition itself agrees, uh, that it originally said Moshe, uh, but uh, some manuscripts ended up changing things or altering it to protect Moses. Uh, so that one's a fairly harmless one, but we can understand why they would want to change that. Uh, Moses' own grandson leading the tribe of Dan into idolatry during the period of the Judges, uh, that's, that's scandalous. Uh, but in the context of the book of Judges, it makes sense because in the book of Judges, basically there's a progression, a downward spiral from bad to even worse, right? So you start off with the beginning, you know, the first couple of Judges are not that bad. You get down to Samson, He's one of the worst people ever. Uh, then you take a look at chapter 17 through 21. We've got stories that just show how bad things have gone uh, for the people of Israel during the time of the judges. Uh, there was no king in the land. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. 
and even Moses' own grandson ends up leading one of the tribes into idolatry. Uh, so that one's a really interesting example. Uh, the next one is, is really short. Uh, this one's uh, Deuteronomy 25, verse 11. Uh, this is a law that talks about uh, two men fighting and the wife of one of the men intervening in the fight uh, by grabbing the other man's private parts, which is a really fascinating one. Why do you need to have a law about that? I mean, was this something that happened quite a bit? Uh, in, in the Hebrew text, in, in, the, in the main tradition that we have, uh, the way that it's worded is, you know, it talks about the woman grabbing that which causes shame. That which causes shame. That, that's, the, that's the word that's used for the private parts. Um, in the Samaritan Pentateuch, on the other hand, uh, it says that uh, the woman grabbed his flesh. Uh, and so what's probably happening here is that the, the main Hebrew tradition that we have is trying to soften the language. They don't want to say private parts. Uh, that, they want to say that which causes shame. And there, there are a number of different places where we see this, either in the, the consonantal text uh, or sometimes in Hebrew in the manuscripts. It, they'll be in the column, it'll say, well, the text says this, but this is what you need to say when you're reading it in the synagogue, right? And very often, uh, there'll be passages, you know, where it'll say that. The text might say, for example, like in Deuteronomy 28, you know, may your enemies rape your wife, uh, you know, as part of a curse. Uh, in, in the side, it'll say, don't say that. <laughs> uh, say, lie with your wife. And so, you know, there's examples where, you know, we have these things that might have been considered vulgar by, you know, later generations. And uh, a scribe says, maybe we shouldn't have that. Uh, or maybe if it's there, we shouldn't read that. But maybe this is an example of, you know, the text actually being changed. That which causes shame rather than referring to it as the person's flesh. Yeah, that's very fascinating. I mean, regarding the Moses one, that... And in some ways, that makes a lot of sense, although, you know, it sounds absolutely crazy that, you know, Moses' grandson would be committing idolatry and all that. But at the same time, you know, the entire, you know, the group of people that Moses led out of Egypt was all going crazy with all that kind of stuff. So, uh, you know, I guess, I guess it's just the culture of uh, how they thought back then in some ways. Um, and then the next one, that was, that's, that's fascinating. I mean, it makes, it makes a lot of sense, though, because you have... All throughout the Old Testament, you have, you know, this lie language, all these euphemisms for sex and all that kind of stuff. So, um, I mean, it's, it's on hand, one hand, it's like, makes me want to ask, like, could all the other stuff be changed? But obviously that'd be kind of ridiculous because there's like, you know, I would assume thousands of or hundreds of times where like, you know, that euphemism occurs and other euphemisms like that. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I would say that, you know, when we take a look at these examples, uh, I, I, I would say that these examples are things that happen fairly late. So, uh, it, I mean, maybe a good way to think about it is that, you know, later generations might have been more prudish uh, than the, you know, the actual writers. So the actual writers, you know, were comfortable saying this thing or that thing. And, and, and sometimes they would use euphemisms and, uh, and that's fine. Uh, but, uh, you know, there, there were less, you know, le it was less problematic for them than later writers. And so uh, my general feeling, again, even though the, the manuscript tradition that we have is incomplete, my general feeling is that uh, earlier on in an earlier stage, these things were just handed down faithfully. And then it's only later on, you know, as things get to be a little bit more strict uh, in terms of, uh, you know, keeping the law and trying to fence the law. Uh, that, uh, you know, some of these changes end up creeping in. So uh, I would say whether we're talking about, uh, you know, the euphemisms that we have here uh, or changing Baal to Bosheth, so Baal to, to shame, uh, or even changing Moses to Manasseh, uh, Moses to Manasseh I think those things are, are generally relatively late. And so in the vast majority of cases, I think uh, we can say, no, this is, this is what the text says. And uh, the reason why we can have that, that amount of confidence is because, is because of these rare examples that we have of things being changed. Uh, because in all of the other cases, uh, those things end up uh, remaining the same. And so based on the evidence that we have right now, uh, the changes seem to be late and they seem to be quite rare. Very fascinating. Uh, so one more question before I let you go. Uh, you know, you say that, you know, all the changes happen late, um, but we really don't have that many texts before, you know, the first century AD where, maybe I'm wrong, but it seems like we don't have that many texts. And it's, it's almost like we have a very small sample size uh, mm -hmm. 
could you talk about how much that plays into our confidence and it, even if it does at all? It, it definitely does uh, play into the confidence that some people have in, in how faithfully things were transmitted. And so there, 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 there's debate among textual critics uh, in terms of uh, what the text might have looked like in, you know, 400 uh, BCE or 300 BCE. Uh, so there's definitely debate on that. Uh, I, I would say I, I'd give maybe may, maybe more of an academic answer and then more of a, a theological answer. And so just from an academic point of view, I would say, you know, there's uh, there's very good evidence that these things were, were definitely handed down uh, faithfully. Uh, and so, you know, when we take a look at... Uh, you know, some of the stories that we have in the Old Testament, for example, we have extra biblical uh, corroboration for a lot of these things. And th- things that, you know, later writers, if they're trying to uh, interpolate uh, or if they're trying to uh, add things or make up stories, th- they probably wouldn't have had access to information uh, like that. So, I mean, one example would be the story of, of Rehoboam, which is, you know, it's a very, you know, it's, it's the, the story itself is set during a time period that is very, very early. Uh, and then it talks about an Egyptian king coming and uh, attacking Jerusalem. And we have corroborating evidence from Egypt itself, right? Uh, Shishank, I believe, is the name. Uh, there's no way that a later writer would have been able to to get that. It would have been able to know that that was the pharaoh. The name's matching up so closely. Uh, and so, you know, there's other examples as well where uh, we take a look at the details. These things must have been handed down uh, faithfully, and I think there would have been a reverence uh, for the text as well. So, uh, you know, getting back to you know levels of uh, evidence, you know, we can't say beyond all reasonable doubt that they were always handed on completely faithfully. But I would say, you know, the preponderance of the evidence for me suggests that you know once these uh, books of the Bible uh, reached uh, a final form, you know, in general, they were handed down uh, quite faithfully. Uh, from a theological perspective, which is totally different. So this is not something that I would, you know, put in an academic book or anything like that. Uh, from a theological perspective, I would say that uh, my confidence in the the authority of the Old Testament and the fact that it was transmitted faithfully ultimately goes back to to Jesus and what I believe about Jesus. And so, uh, you know, in terms of my own faith, I, I did become a Christian when I was very young uh, and recommitted myself. Uh, you know, my last year of high school became more serious about that. Uh, but the reason why I stay a Christian is because of what I believe about the actual evidence that we have for the fact that Jesus really did exist, uh, the fact that he really did die on a cross, and the fact that he really did die, uh, rise again from the dead. You know, things that can be uh, dealt with on a historical level, uh, that gives me confidence that Jesus really was who he said he was, uh, and that he's someone who needs to be followed and, and trusted. And so based on that, just from a theological perspective, so a faith perspective, again, again, not in an academic book whatsoever, that makes me trust Jesus' view of the Old Testament. And so Jesus trusted uh, the, the reliability of the Old Testament when it comes to historical matters, uh, but he also trusted it in terms of the faithfulness of the transmission of the Old Testament. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, there would have been 100% agreement during the time of Jesus in terms of what this passage said or that passage said. When it comes to to some of the details, we even see some of that in the New Testament uh, itself as well, where it might quote a text that is a little bit different from the Hebrew that we have. Uh, But uh, my theological confidence goes back to the view that Jesus would have had. Uh, So I'd say on a theological level, yes. Uh, But even on an academic level, you know, there's lots of gaps in our knowledge. Uh, but uh, I would say there's enough there that uh, I would need to have a lot more evidence to the contrary to convince me uh, that it wasn't uh, faithfully handed down. What, what a great way to end. Uh, Dr. Mark Crenshaw, this has been awesome. It's been a great opportunity. I'm sure a lot of people got out of it. A lot of people got a lot out of this. Could you um, point people to your website and your YouTube channel, any other um, things that we could uh, check out your information on? Yeah, so I have a YouTube channel that uh, I haven't made a video for quite a while. I've been very, very busy, but uh, uh, you can look me up on YouTube. Uh, I believe if you type in Mark Stephen Francois, you should be able to get that. Uh, lots of videos on uh, on classical Syriac, uh, a, a couple of on, on textual criticism, and I hope to be adding more as well once I get some time. Uh, my website, uh, if, if my memory is correct, www.markfrancois.wordpress.com. If you type in my name, uh, you will get there. Uh, and uh, there's information there, especially on classical Syriac. So I'm posting all of my chapters uh, on there in PDF format, also on my academia.edu page. Uh, 
And uh, right now I'm in the process of revising everything. I'm hoping to have revised versions of the first 12 chapters up uh, by the end of October. So I've been staying up super late, sometimes till three in the morning, <laughs> trying to get these things done. Uh, but that's the goal. And uh, yeah, and uh, I do have a contact email on my about page there. So if you ever do have any questions about anything, uh, let me know, or I'll probably see comments that are done on this video as well, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Awesome. Thank you so much. I hope you have a great rest of your day, Dr. Mark. Yeah, you too. Thanks for having me. Of course.